Today is a very special day, of course, as I'm sure many of you are aware who are here joining us. We have Zoom sessions six days a week, the Sunday being where we invite a special guest and we're incredibly blessed to have dear Mona Mahmoudi, who's going to be presenting for us today. For the rest of the week, Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays and Fridays, we're studying the revelation of Baha'u'llah and Wednesday is the advent of divine justice. So you are all welcome to join us with the same link at the same time on any of those days. As I'm sure you're aware, it's the 39th anniversary of the LSA of Tehran being executed on the 4th of January in 1982. So this is the 39th anniversary of that. Our speaker, I will allow her to introduce herself, an incredible human whose both parents have paid the ultimate sacrifice as Baha'is. I believe her father was in the first NSA that was very sadly after the 78-79 revolution was abducted on the 21st of August 1980. And we've never understood exactly what's happened, but it's considered that he's um, obviously been martyred. The uh, second NSA of Iran was executed on the 27th of December 1981. And her dear mother was an auxiliary board member who was meeting with the NSA when that took place. But I'm sure dear Conor Mahmoudi will confirm and will explain further as we commemorate what's happened. So a very, very warm welcome to each and every one of you. As I say, you are all warmly, warmly invited and it's, and it's great to see so many of you here and um, to get a chance in English to really commemorate what's happened because quite often these things take place in Farsi and many of us miss out on the magnitude of exactly what's taken place. So if I could ask dear Rose to please kick us off and then we'll go straight over to Khan Mahmoudi. Thank you very much. Hello. As long as in dawn, Rahoyo, Baby Oceani, a bony as long, her was in. از گل خانی فانی غایب شد و در گل شنی باقی منزل و مواجه از این جهان تاریک و تنگ آهنگ جهان بیبو و رنگ نمون زمینی بود آسمانی شد از خاک دانه فانی بود به جهان یزدانی پی برد محسون مباش دلخون مگرد افسرده منشی آزرده مشو اگر بدانی که در چاوشیانه لانه نموده البته الحان بدی اش رو به سمع جان استمان مایی که به تحلیل و تکبیر و تسبیح 
مشغول است مطمئن باش که نهالی پربرگ و سمری و با میوه و بری بل الله الموهبت الكبرى وليك التحية والسنة Alapa to each and every one of you across the globe right now. We're in for a very special treat as we have dear Mona Mahmoudi, who has graciously accepted to uh, speak to us on this very delicate subject, which of course has shaped her life dramatically. So dear Mona Mahmoudi, the floor is over to you and thank you so much for agreeing to do this with us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's a truly, truly and a privilege and an honor, honestly, uh, about uh, just any time that you know one one is invited to talk about the these sacrifices it's it's a blessing it's an uh, it's an incredible blessing before i start i'd like to acknowledge uh my sister ariana and her husband kehan khadem who joined us from new zealand i think it's early in the morning and uh we cannot see their beautiful faces right now but i know just wanted to say that uh, it's a very um emotional time of the year always, especially for my sister, because when my parents were, were executed, uh, she was a pioneer in Solomon Islands, uh, which is a far away, you know, a little island in the Pacific Ocean. And there was not a lot of communication at that time, so it was especially difficult on her. And uh, my, my brother, Artin, and I were residing in the United States, so there were no uh, problem with communication at that time. So I wanted to acknowledge that. And I asked uh, my sister Ariana if she wanted to jump in and say anything. And uh, so um, I just wanted to acknowledge her being here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rose and Dave and uh, everyone who's put this program together. Um, there is so much to talk about uh, today. So I'd like to maybe start by uh, giving a bit of a context um, you don't know me, and nobody, none of you guys know me. So I'm going to say a few words about myself, so that to put you in the context of what has uh, transpired in our lives, and then by extension, of course, what has happened to the Baha'is in Iran and their sacrifices and the, their families, and of course these martyrs and those who have sacrificed uh, for Baha'u'llah, they don't belong to their families; they belong to 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 the entire world. Uh, and more than that, um, you know, there is a collection of uh, tablets and prayers that the Universal House of Justice put together. Uh, originally, of course, they were mostly in Persian and Arabic from Baha'u'llah, the Bab, Abdul Baha, and Shafi Effendi. And this beautiful collection called Nar Vanur, which means fire and light, it's a collection of hundreds of prayers and tablets about martyrdom, about sacrifice. And uh, I think a good portion of that was translated into English by the Universal House of Justice. And it was published in the Baha'i World volume that encompassed the years 1980 to 1983. And uh, so maybe uh, we can look at one of those tablets. And uh, basically, it, it's all about uh, the meaning of sacrifice, the meaning of martyrdom. And of course, I cannot, I don't know, I mean, each person would understand it according to their own, um, you know, um, experiences and, and, and uh, deep, depending on how deep they are, etc. whatever. It's a mystery of sacrifice. So again, my name is Mona Mahmoudi Sana. Uh, I was born and raised in Iran in a Baha'i family. My sister and I, my sister Ariana, who's also on the Zoom, who's one year older than I. Uh, we were like twins growing up together. Uh, we came both out of Iran uh, to go to university. In fact, 
my sister and I spent a year in Brighton, Hove, and London in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. And we both did our O-levels and A-levels uh, somewhere in England. Uh, then my sister went to um, Pioneer in Solomon Islands and uh, Philippines and then Solomon Islands. And then I came to United States. So I was a student uh, in the United States uh, studying and wanting to finish my studies and then go back to Iran to serve. And uh, mind you, this is early 70s and Iran as a country was going forward, progressing in all kinds of areas. And so my parents wanted us to come out, get a good education, go back to Iran and contribute to the betterment of society, which they really uh, were so much always talked about it and they dedicated their lives in Iran to uh, serving uh, humanity. Of course, since they happened to live in Iran, uh, they, they wanted to serve their country. So I was very blessed um, to be able to um, attend some of the best universities in, United, in the United States uh, and um, getting deeply involved in my studies and mathematics was uh, what I really loved to do. So I was deeply in mathematics and I was doing my doctoral degree in, in pure mathematics. And I was at the beginning of writing my PhD dissertation where um, the revolution took place and so my whole, um, everything just came to an abrupt, abrupt halt and the direction of my life changed. Um, so, uh, and we knew, um, all of us, my sister, myself and my brother, we knew that uh, what the revolution and, and the taking over of the Islamic government, uh, actually the establishment of this Islamic government meant uh, for specifically our family for the Baha'is, of course, in general, and then for our family. As both of uh, our parents uh, were prominent and well-known Baha'is in Iran, and not only within the Baha'i community, as they served for many, many years and decades on the local and national scene in Iran, and within the Baha'i community. And they were also well-known and prominent in their areas of work. Uh, my father was a, um, a very well-known and uh, loved and trusted television personality in Iran. And uh, he was a lawyer by training, uh, but he never really uh, practiced as a lawyer. He was a documentary film producer and writer, a poet and educators. And my mother was the first physics poet um, in University of Tehran. And she was a meteorologist and then later on, um, uh, you know, she headed the last job she had. She was basically heading the, um, the Department of Atmospheric Science and Research in Iran, which was like an, uh, the last position she had was an undersecretary of defense, which was a civilian position, but quite prominent. Uh, so we knew what was gonna happen to, to our parents and they had prepared us as if uh, since we did have the opportunity to talk to them on the phone uh, once in a while. So uh, my father, I'm gonna share with you some pictures. And my father was a member of the first National Assembly of Iran. And the reason we say the first is it's not, a, uh, it's not accurate. Uh, the National Assembly had existed in Iran for hundreds of years, right? So they were not the first one, but it's sort of customary to refer to them because they were the National Spiritual Assembly that existed, that was uh, there when the revolution happened. So we refer to them as the first National Assembly. And, um, and then my, mo my mother uh, served on the subsequent second National Assembly of Iran. And uh, so what I like to do actually maybe um, Maybe later I can share some pictures and then put things in context a little bit. Okay, so um, once the, these executions happened um, and um, naturally in the United States and all over the world in the, by the direction of the Universal House of Justice, uh, the, the different national communities started um, giving uh, light to the um, plight of the Baha'is in Iran. And uh, I remember that the early 90s, uh, early 80s, um, I was very much involved in, in, in many, many of such um, 
uh, events such as like, you know, the, um, uh, you know, both radio and television uh, uh, talking and talking about the, the persecution because it was intensely uh, personal. And of course, as you know, uh, in, in media, they always look for a, um, a personal uh, angle. So I was a good person because both of my parents were uh, executed. And um, so I had the bounty of, of, uh, of giving voice to the, uh, to the voiceless Iranian Baha'is at that time, whenever the opportunity came. And um, one of the things uh, on the international, on the, the national scene, uh, one of the areas that the National Assembly of the United States worked on uh, was uh, they managed to have a, uh, to participate uh, and be invited to participate in a congressional hearing in 1982. Uh, the US Congress put this congressional hearing together and uh, I had the bounty of being invited as an eyewitness to that congressional hearing myself and three members of the National Assembly of, of, United, of United States. Um, and what I like to do, I know that you are familiar with the, with the concept of the persecution of the Baha'is in Iran, but just to give it a bit of a context, uh, I'm just gonna read two paragraphs, if you, with your permission, uh, from a, um, this is a Baha'i World Order magazine, and inside of it is the, um, a testimony of the National Spiritual Assembly members of the Baha'is of the United States and myself as an eyewitness. Uh, and uh, the opening statement by uh, a congressman uh, gives a very um, concise uh, description of what was happening at that time. And then we're gonna get into the 39th anniversary so to put everything in perspective. So this is uh, the opening statement of Honorable Don Bunker. Uh, he's saying uh, the Constitution of the Islamic Republic of Iran, just as a reminder for everyone here, uh, which recognizes and protects the Jewish, Christian, and Zoroastrian minorities in that country, nevertheless denies recognition to Iran's largest religious minority, the Baha'is. As a result, Iran's uh, 300,000 Baha'is are deprived of any form of protection under the law. From the time of its birth in 1844, and at no stage in its history has the Baha'i faith been granted recognition as an independent religion by the Iranian government or under the Iranian constitution. The Baha'is have been considered heretics within Islam since their religion was founded at that time 138 years ago, but now about over 176 years ago in Iran. Since the inception of the Baha'i faith, they have lived in a climate of constant repression, characterized by frequent outbreaks of violence and bloodshed. In the early days, over 20,000 Baha'is were killed under subsequent regimes, including the former Pahlavi, Pahlavi's the Shah, the religious persecution of the Baha'is continued. Uh, mind you, this is really significant because this is the opening statement in the US Congress. Now, once again, in post-revolutionary Iran, uh, differences in religious ideology are being used by fanatical elements to justify violent attacks on the Baha'i community. In March of 1980, two Baha'is were executed for teaching the Baha'i faith. 14 more were executed in June of 1980 for practicing their religion. In August of the same year, 14 members of the the Baha'i administrative body disappeared. Last December, eight members of the Baha'i National Assembly were executed. And in January, six months, six members of the local governing body of Tehran were executed. Baha'i shrines and cemeteries have been desecrated, administrative centers and savings confiscated. A systematic effort appears underway to eliminate the Baha'i religion from Iran. So this is uh, an excerpt from the opening statement. And the reason I read this because it gives you the context. And at that time, this was May 25th of 1982. And at that time when this uh, congressional hearing was held, uh, we, it was the beginning of the persecution. But nevertheless, at that time, uh, it refers to the abduction and, and of, of the uh, First National Assembly of Iran, 
execution of the Second National Assembly of Iran and the execution of six members of the LSE of Tehran. So today is 39th year anniversary of the execution of six members of the LSE of Tehran. And uh, one week ago, it was the 39th anniversary of execution of the Second National Assembly of, of Iran. So this, I hope, gives you uh, a context and sets the context. Uh, this picture, honestly, whenever I look at this, is like uh, it just opens up a different world. This is a picture that was taken about maybe six months before the abduction and disappearance of the First National Assembly of Iran. And I'll tell you well, well, who, who the, the members were. So these two people sitting in the middle, this is my father, Hushang Mahmoudi, and this is my mother, Jinus Mahmoudi. So everybody in this picture, except this lady, whose name is Giti Vahid, uh, they have been executed. And uh, this picture was taken at a time when the National Assembly of Iran, the first National Assembly, because the members are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, they were meeting with the local assembly of Tehran and the local assembly of Tehran members are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. And my mother at that time was serving as an auxiliary board member. And because of the uh, special circumstances in Iran, uh, the Baha'i community, of course, since it was being persecuted, the Universal House of Justice had asked that um, uh, the responsibilities of the uh, of the council or board, a continental board of council would be carried by uh, three of the auxiliary board members in Iran. And one of them was my, my mother, Janus. And so at every meeting of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of Iran, uh, one or two members of the auxiliary board were present just to be there as support. So in this picture, my mother is representing the, uh, the institution, uh, the uh, I guess uh, the institution of the, of the of the of the councilors, and so we have a national assembly, a local assembly, and an institution of the councilors, and and the, it shows the unity between the elected and the appointed branches of the of the of the, of the Baha'i administration. And of course, there are so many wonderful points that one we can talk about, but maybe later on. But so this was several months before uh, the, the uh, not, local assembly of, I mean, national assembly of Iran. The first one was abducted, never heard from. That was on 21st of uh, August of 1980. And uh, um, just a couple of months ago, the 40th anniversary was, was uh, commemorated. Again, it, I think it was all in, in Persian language. Uh, this is a picture of the first national assembly of Iran. I think it's in the same house. Uh, and uh, the nine of them are here several months later, they're abducted and uh, never heard from. This is my father sitting here. This is a picture of uh, the entirety of the local spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of, of Tehran, and whose 39th uh, anniversary is being commemorated today. They were executed January 4th of 1981. Uh, so the people that you see here, uh, except for exception of a few of them uh, belong to the institutions and they're all gone. So let me just point out, uh, this is my mother, uh, Genus. Uh, this is uh, the host, uh, the hostess for the local spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of Tehran, who was uh, arrested along with the local assembly of Tehran, was imprisoned. And subsequently she was also executed, even though she was not a member of the Baha'i institution and her story is, is one of heroism and total sacrifice. What was her name? Shidroch uh, Baga. This is her husband. Um, I think this lady, I don't know her, this one, this one, and this person, and uh, maybe this gentleman and this gentleman um, probably were not part of the executions but the rest were. This is Shiva Mahmoudi, my, my uh, 36 year old cousin who was a member of the local assembly of Tehran and she was executed on January 4th of 1981. 
So again, this is a historical uh, picture. The quality of the pictures are really not that good because uh, it's like um, uh, taking pictures and copying over copy and copy and copy. So <coughs> I have better quality pictures, but I don't. I could not uh, locate them at that time. Anyway, so this is really the context. So the Second National Assembly, uh, I don't have a picture of the entirety of the Second National Assembly. So what happened was that after the abduction and disappearance of the First National Spiritual Assembly, the Second National Assembly was elected and the way the elections took place was also has a historical <coughs> context and also it's, it's it was different because that Universal House of Justice had allowed uh, the Baha'is in Iran in their last national convention uh, to uh, vote for not only nine people, but more than three times or four times nine people uh, because they were well, very well aware that Universal House of Justice was very well aware that uh, whoever becomes a member of these national institutions or even local institutions in these large cities, basically, if they accept to serve, it was basically writing their own death sentence. And so after the disappearance of the First National Assembly, what happened is that the next nine members, nine people who had the highest votes uh, in the last national convention uh, automatically were promoted to this, uh, were elected to the Second National Assembly. And uh, so my mother happened to be one of those. And then, um, so that's the way it happened. And, and it was not even uh, 24 hours before the, the work of the Second National Assembly started right after the abduction of the First National Assembly. So there was really no um, distance uh, in terms of no vacuum uh, in terms of the leadership of the uh, Baha'i community in Iran. This is my mom and dad. Uh, this was probably taken about two to three years before their death. My mother was 52 years old at the time of her execution, and my father uh, was 53 years old. And honestly, when I look back, um, uh, realizing how much uh, these people had contributed in a very short period of time, relatively short lifespan. And just to uh, make sure that I, I mentioned everyone, you know, the members of these uh, administrative bodies in Iran were all the cream of the crop. I, I don't know if that's the, the right phrase to use, but the cream of the crop of their society, of the Iranian society. And uh, many articles uh, were written afterwards uh, just lamenting the loss of, of, of so much talent and uh, you know, good people in Iran who could have contributed to the advancement of this country of ours. Uh, so this is really um, pictures that I wanted to share and, and I apologize for the quality and the size of the pictures. During the time that uh, my parents, my, my experience and my parents were still alive in Iran and before my mother was executed, uh, she, uh, she traveled throughout Iran and she wrote a lot of letters and reports and sent them to the Universal House of Justice. And she also wrote letters uh, to my sister and I and my brother. And uh, so there are a lot of reports and um, also a lot of will and testaments, last will and testament of the Baha'is uh, who were imprisoned and subsequently executed. I must mention that after the congressional hearing, uh, shortly after that, uh, local assemblies of Tabriz were executed, a local assembly of uh, Tehran, of course, Tabriz and Hamedan, and uh, many other localities of uh, the, the prominent members were abducted, uh, imprisoned, and executed. Also, after the execution of the Second National Spiritual Assembly, the Baha'is of Iran, and after the execution of the local assembly of Tehran, uh, a third national assembly was, was came to being, uh, and the members of those uh, that the third national assembly uh, this time were also captured, imprisoned, and executed. But the, but. Uh, but this time they were not in a meeting or, and they were not arrested altogether. They were arrested one at a time. So after the execution of the Third National Assembly of Iran, the Iranian government basically banned the, the administration in Iran 
And so there were no more uh, Baha'i, you know, official Baha'i administration in Iran. Um, the will and the testament of a lot of the Baha'is who were facing execution, um, these will and, will and testaments were so powerful and it gave such a testimony to uh, the, the, the courage, the steadfastness, perseverance, and, and just the beauty of the faith of Baha'u'llah and the fact that these people, these people who were prominent members of their community, and these were people not unlike the dawnbreakers, you know, I, I think uh, the sacrifices of these people are, is no less than the dawnbreakers. Uh, in, in a way, I think it's more difficult. They were mostly educated in the West. These people had degrees. They had jobs, you know, the whole of uh, culture of martyrdom, which was part of the Shia, you know, Islam uh, culture uh, wasn't necessarily part of their lives. And, uh, but, and yet they gave their lives uh, for the betterment of humanity and the establishment of the oneness of mankind. So these letters, these testaments um, were so powerful, vast majority of them were so incredibly powerful and they were printed, they were duplicated, they were uh, sent out and many, many people, thousands of people around the world shared them and the Iranian government all of a sudden realized, oh my goodness, these are such wonderful testimony to who these people were, so it doesn't look good on us. Therefore, they banned, they stopped uh, asking. In fact, they forbid the Baha'is to write their will and testament. So when it came to my mother, there was no will and testament. However, there were tons of letters and reports from from them and of course we received some uh, there were some personal letters written to us as their children as my mom's children and then there were other reports of the uh, execution martyrdom and sacrifice of baha'is elsewhere uh, what i like to do is um uh, read an excerpt uh, forgive me i'm jumping up and down there's so much to cover and uh we can start talking about what you're interested in we can we can cover it in, in subsequent sessions or uh, we can go in, into depth. So when these letters were written uh, at the Testaments, of course, they were written in, in the Persian language. And um, Dr. Amin Banani, who is a prominent um, Iranologist and a professor uh, at the University of California in Los Angeles, he took uh, several of the letters uh, that my mom had written and he started translating them. This is in 1980s, I remember those times. Um, it was during the fast of 1982, I remember when Dr. Banani was translating these letters. It was such, uh, this, is, this is this incredible uh, Persian Baha'i scholar. And um, uh, he had a hard time translating this stuff. And, um, uh, he was sharing with us how difficult it was and that uh, spending the fast during the, the fast period of that year translating these letters and um, I'm going to read uh, something that he wrote. These letters, some of them were um, published in this World Order magazine and um, some of the other ones are printed in English, translated, I think, by um, um, uh, by the Baha'i World Center and, and they're published in, in the last, in one of the, the volumes of the Baha'i World. But uh, what Dr. Banani experienced translating these, uh, he translated uh, three letters. One of them was, two of them was from my mother. One was a uh, personal letter that my mom wrote to us. One of the many letters she wrote to us. And then one was the account of the uh, martyrdom of the, uh, local assembly of Hamedan, which took place about six months on June 27th of 1981, exactly six months before my mom was, was and, and the National Assembly of Iran, the second National Assembly was, was, was killed. So the reason I wanna read this, I think you will discover why I think um, it's good to read this because um, he talks about what is martyrdom. I'm, I'm going to read this one paragraph and uh, then I'm gonna read an extra from one of my mom's letters and then we can open this up if you have any questions and then uh, whatever else uh, that, that uh, 
the host and the hostess and uh, Dave and Rose uh, would want us to do. So this is from Amin, Dr. Amin Barani. He says, what is martyrdom? The coin is debased every day by acts of mindless zeal and blind fanaticism. In these letters and testaments from some of the Baha'is, Baha'i men and women who have been put to death for their faith in Iran, we have a reaffirmation of the dignity, sanity, and humanity of that station. These are not desperate people consumed by the death wish. They are balanced individuals dedicated to the ennobling of life through a new world order. They are not superhuman beings, but ordinary men and women whose true humanity is perfected in the fires of tests and tribulations. If there is an inspiration to be gained from their experiences and their deaths, it is not one of pathos and grief, but one of the affirmation of the capacity of human beings for spiritual growth. The measure of that growth is not only the eternal glory of those who have died, but also the vital promise for us who live. It is in the hope for the realization of that promise that I have made these translations. With such examples, we should have an easier time rising to our potential and attaining our goal. All these heroic men and women have ascended the ultimate heights of spiritual attainment, but we are particularly fortunate to have the letters and reports of Jinus Mahmouti, who emerges as a woman of exceptional qualities. Her radiant spiritual growth is matched by a keen intellect and an acute sense of history and a rare gift of expression, which I feel will enrich the annals of Baha'i history forever. She has been able to capture the full spiritual, emotional and intellectual impact of the events through which she had lived and died. I mean, Banani. So I like to, if the context is sufficient, I like to maybe uh, read an excerpt from one of the letters of my mom that Dr. Banani um, uh, translated. And then we can open up. Uh, is that okay, Rose? Sure. Sure. I just don't want people to get tired. Uh, there is so much um, to, to cover and uh, we can cover things at different times as well. Uh, but um, just this letter that she wrote to, uh, to us. My children, uh, my sister Ariana, myself and my brother Artin. And of course, there are personal things she goes through. And then she talks about the fact that she, the, la the week before she had um, visited the prisoners in Hamadan, the local assembly of Hamadan. And, um, and, uh, and what she had found in these Hamadani people. When my mother was an auxiliary board member, uh, the local assembly of, of Hamadan itself was, it, was in her jurisdiction. So she had a very special relationship with the members of the, uh, the Baha'i community in Hamadan, including their families. And so she visited them in prison many times. And I think this was probably the last time she visited them. And of course, later on, she wrote this incredible um, description uh, of, of, of their martyrdom from the beginning to the end. And it's like 30 pages, uh, and Dr. Banani translated that. It's really like you're reading the Dawnbreakers. There's no difference. And um, except this time an eyewitness is, is, is interpreting and telling you how she found them and the spiritual growth that they had, they had uh, accomplished from the beginning of their imprisonment to the end where basically they were getting near to, to, to to the death, to 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 unite, being united with their beloved Baha'u'llah. So my mom says, I'm just going to read this and then we'll finish this. She says, "Ah, oh, those Hamadan friends, these are the local assembly of, of Hamadan. May I offer up my life for all of them. 
for every one of them, for all their heroism and sacrifice that has set forward the cause of God by 200 years. How I feel insignificant before the greatness of their being. It is the fruit of their lives that has brought about such changes in the world. I and the likes of me on the outside run around doing the same things we did before. It's no feat. The heroic feats belong to them and to those whom we have not seen yet and don't even know their whereabouts. Uh, referencing that the First National Assembly, but whose existence we sense. You may have difficulty understanding this sentence because I am sure you have not experienced this sensation but I, my dear children, sense that daddy exists. Daddy is right around, close by. I sense his existence with a sixth sense or seventh or tenth. I don't know, but he exists. And the rest of them too, I sense their being, etc. And then she says, sometimes I feel that my turn will come too. And why not? It won't come only if at, at other times too, I should be spared by his will as I have been so far, but then I don't dwell on such things. They don't fit in with my difficult and heavy schedule. When that time comes, I'll adjust myself to it. My feelings, dear children, are complete submission and total dedication. Only one thing counts, to do the work that I must do and what pleasure is hidden in these tasks too. I cannot really describe for you nor can you truly comprehend it because I too had not tasted it until now. And I only wish that he not take this pleasure away from me as long as I am alive. It is higher than kingship, greater than any gratification. You are working with Baha'u'llah and you sense his being and you see that it is he who gives the commands, he who chooses the paths and who solves the difficulties and never leaves me alone. My dear children, I don't want to write you more about these matters. I only want you to know that I lack nothing. There is no sorrow, absolutely no difficulties. I am content, well, fortunate, assured, serene, full of energy and thankful. Whatever should happen, there could be nothing better. I am sure your daddy too has the same feeling. Many people feel this way today. I wish that you too could comprehend our joy. When I'm full of contentment, then I'm afraid, afraid that my call for working, serving and sacrifice may come to an end and my portion be filled. My children, with your pure hearts, pray that what he has given us with his bounty, he not take away with his justice. Don't you ever think that what has passed with us or will come to pass, the grandeur and the intensity of which I sense and its dread was a hardship or an unbearable pressure. No, it's just the opposite. He has removed all the pressures from us. He has lightened us so much that we can soar. And right now we are prepared to endure a hundred times more. Only pray that we may be worthy to endure. And then she says goodbye to her children. The reason I wanted to read this is that this is not only the sentiment of my mother, it's also the sentiment of those, the vast majority of Iranian Baha'is, especially those uh, who were imprisoned and whose lives were in danger. So it is not grief and pathos, it's really the hope, um, and the promise of a spiritual growth uh, that, uh, that we can all look forward to. I think I've talked too much and uh, so maybe we can open this up and however you want to. This is the very first prayer that the, um, in this collection uh, of Nar and Nur, uh, Fire and Light, and it's a writing it's a, uh, by Baha'u'llah and it's, it is such a, um, a you know, just, 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 just comfort uh, for for those, for all of us. I think. Um, okay, Rick, please. Thank you, Mona John. Mona, I want to say what a treasure you and your family are. 
and how close you are to that tree, that beautiful tree of your parents. And I saw your father's picture and my beloved brother, our teen is the essence of your father. And I see such grace and love and beauty in this family. All praise be to God who from every drop of blood shed by his chosen ones hath brought, hath brought forth a vast creation whose number none but himself can reckon. He hath raised them to be the embodiments of his love and the manifestations of his tender affection. It is they who are the hands of his cause amongst men. It is they who have rendered aid unto God to every age and have arisen to promote that which he hath purposed in such wise that the majesty of the kings and their dreadful might have failed to affright them, nor have they been hindered from following the path of truth by the clash of arms and the furious clamor of battalions. They have raised their triumphal cry amidst all that dwell in the heavens and on the earth, summoning everyone unto the Lord of all mankind, he who is the ruler of the world, of this world and of the next, the God of the throne on high and of the earth below. Thank you very much, dear Rick, for reading uh, that for us. And of course, um, Dr. Mahmoudi Zana, thank you so much for opening up your heart and sharing these things with us. Again, many of us have uh, no idea about these things that happen or are able to see into the window, which you've so beautifully um, shown us to uh, try and understand a little bit about what happened and really try and understand what true sacrifice is. So um, it's with a very heartfelt thank you. We applaud you and, and thank you so much for, for sharing what you have done. With your permission, Demona, if, if possible, I know there are some people who have some questions and I invite you to do so. If you could please raise your hand. We have a couple of people with raised hands already who have some questions. We also have one of the 10 women who was martyred, uh, dear uh, Zarin Mogimi. Um, we have uh, her, her brother and her sister are here from Canada and from Sweden as well. So I know there's other people who've been affected by these things. So we're very blessed to have some people who have great links to these various things. But firstly, I'd like to invite Dr. Danesh, um, dear Tahara, to share a comment or a question. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dave John Monaj, and with your permission, I just want to say a couple of words, if it's okay with you. I think Nana is still here too. I just wanted to share, friends, um, you know, listening to Mona or Nana every time is, um, you know, a blessing for um, those of us who knew the Mahmoudis. Um, but I think what is of direct relevance to all of us who are sitting here at this moment in human history is not so much the experience of Mr. Mahmoudi facing enforced um, disappearance or Mrs. Mahmoudi execution. It is how they live their lives that we really need to become intimately familiar with because Mr. and Mrs. Mahmoudi were highly accomplished individuals who had every opportunity to have lavish lifestyle. Yet they chose consciously in 1971 to move to one of the most remote parts north of Tehran to form a local assembly and to form a city, an entire town. And by making that decision, their lives became completely available to the entire community, whether they were Baha'is or not. Everything they had became very simple. Mrs. Mahmoudi, for those of you who have seen her photo, if you had seen her in person, Grace Kelly had nothing on Jean Mahmoudi because not only she was gorgeous, 
But that spirit and that brain was phenomenal. And yet the way she dressed, the manner in which she shopped, the brands that she chose to wear are far from many, many of us desire to do these things. They were completely detached. And Mr. Mahmoudi, who was in essence, the Mr. Rogers of Iran, the way he transformed, he created the concept of childhood and parenting in Iran through his program. These individuals chose a lifetime of martyrdom. It wasn't about the last two weeks of their lives or the last few moments. It was about a lifetime of making conscious decisions to allow everyone else to have priority in terms of the services that they were able to render. And I really hope that, um, you know, for those who read Farsi, Nana has, you know, beautifully written the account of Mr. and Mrs. Mahmoudi. It's been published in Farsi. It's available online free of charge. It needs to be read and reread and cherished over and over again. So please take the time, friends, to make yourselves more familiar with the Mahmoudis because um, for those who are familiar with, with the Baha'i machinery and the Baha'i community, we know that recently we have received a communication from the international governing body of this faith. And they have told us that the decades ahead um, are going to be quite interesting and eventful. And now is the time for us to model ourselves consciously to become minimalists like the Mahmoudis were in terms of material possession and become completely immersed in forming societies around us. So I beg of you to read the beautiful book that Nana has written and to continue to, to spend time with Mona and Nana and whenever our team is comfortable to ensure we learn from them, to, to, to just through osmosis, sense the Mahmoudis because they are, from what I see in my daily life, every day they're influential in what's happening around us. And I hope that we take the time and I hope Mona and Nana don't mind it because I know they're very busy people, but we need to see more of them and hear more about them and help them to bring the story of Genus and Hushai Mahmoudi to the entire globe. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Mona Jun and Nana Jun for making tonight happen. Thank you very much, dear, uh, dear Sahara, for those comments. Thank you so much. And dear Mona, if at any point you want to respond, of course, please do. If not, we have a uh, dear brother Thotter uh, joining us all the way from India quite late night who would like to make a, a comment or two. Uh, brother Thotter, please. Alaba. Thank you, my dear brother Dev. First of all, I thank you, my dear Mona Mahmoudi, for your excellent and uh, greatest presentation because of this London Zoom. Also, we have to be very thankful and grateful to our brother, Mr. Dave, and my sister, Rose Kayani, for uh, starting this Zoom for the last uh, seven, uh, 10 months. Within two months, it is going to be one year baby. Because of this London Zoom, we are meeting together here. Also, because of COVID-19, mm -hmm. made us very beneficial for all the Baha'i communities throughout the world. Also, I would like to request of Mona Mahmoudiji, please be cool, don't be upset. Your parents are very happy in the Abba Kingdom. That is the plan of Bahá'u'lláh. Yes. That is in the hands of Bahá'u'lláh only. Yes. Your family is a very blessed family. We are the chosen ones by Bahá'u'lláh. Yes. Also, I want to ask you one question. How old are you when your parents are executed in Iran? I was probably 28 or 29, yeah. I was living in the United States and uh, uh, my brother and I were in the US studying. My sister was at that time in Solomon Islands. Uh, so none of us were in Iran. Uh, in a way it was good, in a way it wasn't good. And I'm sorry, I got emotional. Normally I don't, but there are always something about this time of the year that is so heavy with those memories it's just, it's just just really really heavy of course we have been able to sort of um, live on you know and, and just being able to compartmentalize and uh, honestly the uh, the biggest challenge at least personally for me has been trying to sort of um, 
get that connection between that world and this world. A lot of times I'm not, um, I'm not successful. Sometimes I am. I basically have to just throw it away sometimes that don't, don't even think about it. And then uh, coming back to this life, I can't really um, function as, as if I want to think about that kind of stuff. But then at the same time, it's such a big part of our existence. It's such a, I mean, it's in every cell of my body, what, you know, uh, you can't really t get away from it. So, um, so the question I think would be really wonderful. What is the meaning of these uh, uh, bloods that are shed? What is the meaning of sacrifice? And, and Tahirajun actually very nicely put it, you know, what do we do, you know, uh, to promote the oneness of mankind? And um, so thank you for your comments. Yeah. Thank you very much for your kind words, Brother Fata, and um, uh, always wonderful to hear you. We have a few more hands up, ladies and gentlemen. So um, next I will go to dear Professor Khodada. Dear Jenna, please, if, uh, if you'd like to uh, make your comment or question. Thank you. It strikes me, Mona, that the term martyrdom in our times has been used so frequently by religious extremists. What you have shared with us defines the true meaning of martyrdom, not to shed the blood of others, but to place one's own life on the altar of sacrifice for one's beliefs. Thank you so much. I've been so moved by it. Although I have known this story, but the way you related this had special significance. I want to thank you and also Artin, and Ariana. Thank you very much for the comments, dear Jenna. And um, I'm sure that's echoed by all of us here. It's um, the way in which it's not been words, it's really touched the heart. So thank you so much. Next, we'll go to dear Mattin in London. Dear Mattin, please. Wanoja, thank you so much for sharing your experience. Um, my question is regarding the, the NSAs. After the two were taken and executed, what what happened next? Were 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 future NSAs then elected? Yes. Uh, also, with the LSA of Tehran, that you said that they um, they were also executed as well. Were subsequent LSAs in Tehran elected, or was it advised to then stop electing um, members of institutions in Iran? So we had the first NSA, the second NSA, and then the third NSA. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, because of the circumstances, the, the last uh, national convention that, that before the revolution or during the revolution or whatever, it was pretty close to revolution when it was clear that normal uh, election cannot take place and that the, the lives of the members of these institutions were in danger, the Universal House of Justice uh, suggested, recommended, and allowed that um, uh, those people with the highest number of votes after the, you know, the first mm -hmm. NSA, they would be automatically be, be you know, go to the, the next NSA. And obviously, um, so because local assembly of Tehran is, was the biggest local assembly in Iran, and so the members were well known, Many of the names of the local assembly members of Tehran, uh, the current one, when they uh, still the, the first national assembly existed, they ended up in at the top, at the top, like after uh, the first, uh, the second, after the twenty-seven, uh, yeah, twenty-seven, you know, twenty-eight. So uh, after my father, the first national assembly went away. My mom was on the next one, and then after that one. Um, uh, those who were, super, were on the LSA of Tehran were promoted to this third NSA. But then by that time, the local assembly of Tehran, six of them were already martyred. And so if you remember, the way to remember this is, uh, and I remember my mom, in one of the letters she mentioned, one of the reports that she read to the, uh, she wrote to the House of Justice, she basically said, if you remember from the Dawnbreakers, uh, the Azan um, Ebar Furush, you know, when they're defending the, the, the fort, they go and then uh, they, they say the Azan and then they're cut down. They come down, the second one goes down, it's gonna be cut down. 
So my mother, after the disappearance abduction of the First National Assembly, writes to the House of Justice and says, Azane bar furush edame darad. The, the, the bar furush, it's continuing. And that was really also, I think, uh, predictive of the fact that there will be only three national assemblies. After the Third National Assembly, the government of re Iran realized, uh-oh, these people are not going to recant because all they needed was one of these members. Just imagine if one of those people in these prominent institutions, the Baha'i institution, had recanted. Just imagine how the, the, the government of Iran would have taken advantage of that, right? So they said, oh, oh we're not going to allow you guys to anymore to have any local assembly, national assembly. And of course, because as Baha'is, we're supposed to be obedient uh, to, the, to the government, uh, then uh, all the institutions, Baha'i institutions, were closed by the order of the Iranian government. So after the, the, that local assembly was executed and the three national assemblies were executed, there were no more assemblies in Iran. Um, and, um, you know, one, one interesting point I was thinking, and I think I shared that with Rose and, and Jenna June the other day. Um, you know, if you look at the mystery of sacrifice, right? And if you look at the timing of these institutions being cut down, uh, somebody yet to have to write, uh, you know, analyze, write, you know, do some critical thinking about what is the meaning of, of these institutions of the faith as institutions being sacrificed, not only as individual, but as institutions. And the fact that even in prison, there are stories that the local assembly of Tehran before its execution, they, they did consult because uh, they were asked, hey, are you going to recant? And they needed some time to consult in prison. And they decided, no, we're not gonna recant. The consultation took place. And uh, so these institutions um, were cut down. There were no more. And, uh, but the sacrifices continues in different formats. And uh, oh, one thing that I wanted to mention was that if you look at the timing of it, in my own small mind, I thought came to my mind that um, the timing was interesting because it was around the same time that the seat of the House of Justice on Mount Carmel was built and that the Universal House of Justice occupied its permanent seat. And so, and that's an institution, that's the, the, the international institution of the faith. So maybe these sacrifices of these institutions, maybe it was necessary for, the, for that universal house of justice, that to take hold, you know. So, um, but there is no more institutions and everything that happens in Iran, even though they're extremely super organized, but they're not according to, they're not behind institutions. Thank you very much for the question, dear Matty. The next question comes all the way from Greenland. If I could ask dear Grace, please. Yeah, I, I wanted to thank you for, for this presentation. And I think it's important because every time the name of these precious souls are mentioned and their stories are told, um, it's in a sense, um, I would even call it peaceful defiance because one of the things that the Iranian government wanted was for all these people to go away and the whole thing to be brushed under the carpet and nobody to talk about them. But in, instead, their stories are being spread around the world. And, and also I was thinking about the, whenever the, because these assemblies were cut down in Iran, there was like more assemblies that started other places in the world. For example, the first local assembly of Greenland was formed in 1979. Um, the National Assembly in 1992. So it was like where it's cut down in one place, it, it comes up in other places. But, but thank you so much for your presentation. And I hope we can hear more because it's really interesting. And it's important that we know in the West and other parts of the world that we know these stories and can tell them. Thank you very much, dear Grace Nielsen from Greenland there. Next comment is coming from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Dear Empire, please. My question was, was concerning the attitudes of Baha'is in the next 19th day phase after the, after the execution. Because um, yesterday we were, we were in consultation with the regional Baha'i Council here. Um, they was trying to stand people's in, in some places to open new clusters. And some of us were afraid because 
the place where, where they were selling, it is a, a war zone. And people are afraid about their phones, the computer, it should be locked there. So they say, no, 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 we will not go there. But I, I, I just want to know because I'm feeling like it is, it is a blessing to be here hearing this testimony today. The question was that the attitude of the Baha'is, right, Dave? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, um, Empire, so that's a very good question. And also, you know, um, the attitude, there are tons written about the attitude and the perseverance and steadfastness of the Baha'is in Iran after all of these events. The vast majority, of course, there are always outliers, right? There are always exceptions, right? So the attitudes of Baha'is in Iran, as you can see with their perseverance and steadfastness and, and the, uh, the fact that it's still, they're still standing strong, despite the persecution that, of course, has taken different formats, uh, they're still moving forward. And uh, so it is also, um, it's important to realize that in the past 40 years, there has been an evolution in terms of the type of persecution that uh, the Iranian government has been uh, wonderfully bestowing over the Baha'i community. The type of persecution has changed. And right now basically is like denying kids to go to school uh, and uh, you know preventing the Baha'is from, from attending universities, et cetera, that I'm sure everybody's aware of. But in general, the attitude has been positive, but you know, they're tired. I am tired of hearing about it. And honestly, I think um, uh, unless we can change, uh, and I think that's, that, that's our challenge. What is it that we need to, to get out of, out of these uh, sacrifices? It's wonderful to hear about it. It's sort of uh, our spirit soars high and then we come down to earth. How do we reflect that sacrifice? How do we, how do we make sure that those, the blood of these martyrs and all the sacrifices that, that's been happening, not only in Iran, ar across the globe, uh, how do we uh, take advantage of that? And how do, we, uh, how do we look at that and see that, how that contributes towards the, you know, the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth? Uh, but uh, the attitude, if I understand, that's the only part of the question. I couldn't really understand the rest of it. I'm not sure if, if I answered your question, but uh, the attitude has been incredible. And there are tons of testimonies to that. Um, you know, at the very beginning of the revolution, when my mother was, was, was writing and things were still fresh, she wrote about children. We're talking about five, six, seven, eight, nine year old children and their attitude and how they were persecuted and how they preserved, persevered in, 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 their, uh, in their faith. Um, so uh, I think maybe, maybe we can share some of those stories and some of those writings, some of those reports at some other time to give it more context. But, the, but as far as I know, the attitude has been uh, really very much in line with, with the, with the uh, tradition of, of the, the, the Babi and the Baha'i faith in Iran. Um, but maybe others have different different experiences. Thank you, dear man. And you, you're, you're so right. This is with the example of, of Mullah Hussein and Barfurush and the people standing up to call to prayer. The beloved guardian translated the Dawnbreakers to have this spiritual link. So we are their spiritual descendants. And of course, you see these same themes replaying. And in this case, exactly that has taken place. One question that has come in, you, you mentioned um, the uh, World Order magazine. Someone was asking what volume number and what, what dates that was. So this is... Um... Uh, World Order magazine, um, uh, fall of 1982. Fall of 1982, um, and then there was um, this one, which is spring of 1982. This is about the congressional hearing and all the testimonies. Uh, it's actually it's interesting historical perspective. I just wrote, I just read the uh, the opening statement just last night. I had never, I had never read it. And uh, then I also read my own testimony and I said, oh my God, my English wasn't really that good, you know? And, and, and I remember when they asked me to, to, to appear in front of the con Congress, I, um, they asked me to write something. So I wrote something really quickly and I had a, you know, a two-year-old son at that time. And I just, I wrote it and I, and I sent it to the National Assembly and I was hoping and I thought that they're going to edit it make it pretty and then send it to the Congress, right? Send it to the subcommittee. And 
I was devastated when I found out because the day before the congressional hearing, we had a little, um, we went over it, we, we did a, um, uh, what is it, tamarind, what is the word for it? Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and I was devastated seeing that my testimony, my, you know, puny testimony was actually not changed, not even a word. And I was shocked when people approached me and said, oh my God, we were so moved. And I thought, you must be joking, you must be kidding me, you know? So um, uh, it is a refreshing thing to read these things because you realize, especially during this incredible uh, tumultuous political time, there was a time that, you know, literally, I mean, United States was really uh, on top of this stuff. And the people that I came to know during the congressional hearing, and then a subsequent year when, I, I, during um, at the Human Rights Day, uh, President Reagan was was in office. You know, I was invited uh, with Dr. Firuz Kazemza. They went to the White House, and and uh, I, I, you know, I gave a couple of you know paragraphs of statement. I remember associating with these politicians. They were really nice people. You know, there was a lot of hope at that time. And I don't know what's going on, but you know. Uh, and, and, you know, this country is going to go through turmoil. And, you know, as, as the Guardian said, spiritual descendants of dawnbreakers, the West, Western people, right? Uh, what does it really mean? Maybe you can talk about that kind of stuff in your fireside. What does it really mean? Uh, Tahir John very eloquently talked about a, a few aspects of that, but, you know, it would, would be really nice to, to talk about it. Thank you, dear man. Thank you very much. The next question from India, uh, dear Manas. Hello, Abba. I would like to know something about the upbringing, their childhood, as youth, how they were brought up so that they could reach such a high level. Well, you know, both of my parents were uh, raised in, 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 um, in Baha'i families, but you know, but that doesn't necessarily, you know, ensure anything, right? It is your own volition. And so you're given the very basic foundation of faith and then you just ride on it. Uh, I know that my father, I remember my father was just, just in love with Abdul Baha. I remember his passion about uh, love and, and, and just loving the central figures of the faith. And he always uh, said that uh, uh, the, the faith was instilled in me by my mother. His mother um, was, you know, like fourth generation Baha'i, he came from a, you know, long line of just like, the vast majority of the Iranian Baha'is, you know. And so the, his mother had, had instilled in him. And, uh, but at the same time, you know, he listened to the guardian. Let me actually share with you, if you don't mind, a very interesting story. Uh, my father, when he was like, you know, 13 years old, 13 or 14 years old, uh, something comes from the guardian, a directive that's asking the Baha'is in Iran to go pioneering. Go spread out, leave Iran, go pioneering. My father at that time was a, a, you know, a, a high school student. So he consults with his parents and he says, I wanna go pioneering, the guardian said so. His parents say, no, you're too young. He says, I don't care. So what happens is that he actually goes and he pioneers to a small village near Mashhad. When he's there, right after he gets there, he has this dream about the guardian. The reason I know about it is because the guardians, uh, you know, the guardians uh, secretary right, writes on behalf of guardian response to his, to his letter. And he was a young man. And uh, it's a mystery, just, just go figure how, what destiny is supposed to be, how, what is the meaning of destiny? So my father, when he gets to, the, to, to this little village, he has a dream and the dream, in the dream, uh, the, the guardian, basically uh, sets up a competition between the Baha'i youth. And the competition is like uh, the guardian uh, throws his, his ring um, somewhere and, and, and asks the youth to go find it. And whoever finds it basically wins. So then my father basically finds the guardian's ring. And so, and he wins the, the competition. And apparently the dream had uh, affected him so much that he writes to the guardian and says, hey, I had this, this, you know, not sorry, not hate, but I had this uh, dream 
and uh, what does it mean? And then, of course, he asks the guardian about the meaning of a, of a, of a statement in, in, in one of Baha'u'llah's tablets. That was the second question. But then uh, I have a copy of that. You know, we all have a copy of that. Um, and my father never told us about this uh, thing. So the guardian, uh, on behalf of the guardian, says uh, he uh, basically bestows a lot of praise on this, on this wonderful, uh, you know, young person and says, you need to persevere. And if you persevere, you, you will um, If you persevere, you will attain uh, to, to the, uh, the apex of, 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 of uh, serving the faith, something like that. And so, so it is part of it is education, part of it is destiny. I, I don't know. Um, so, if, as for my mother, she actually suffered quite a bit as, as a child because, you know, she was very sensitive, uh, but she also came from um, a prominent Baha'i family, and um, it, actually her, her father was the, the establisher of, 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 the, um, of the print, um, uh, you know, the, the, the modern print in Iran. Thank you for sharing that, dear Mona. And a correction, dear, dear Manas is not from India, she's from Suriname. We have a couple more questions. Dear Nancy, thank you very much for being patient. Thank you very much. Uh, Mola John, uh, I remember you uh, very vaguely uh, because of the color of my hair. Of course, I'm much older than you. And I, I think that I um, owe your parents, especially your father, to explain to you that during the period of time that I had the privilege to know him from the age of nine, when he came to Babol to uh, encourage the pioneers that my family were pioneer at the time uh, to stay and do the things and so forth. Uh, the memory I have from that time uh, that was a stick with me for the rest of my life is he was always saying things that it was true, it was serious, but it was always with fun. Uh, so the picture that you show from your parents that uh, uh, they're standing together uh, and your father was laughing, I don't believe he's doing that. He did that because of the picture. This is what he was. Um, and I remember that uh, in one occasion, he explained to some of the youth that uh, the life is what it is is either good or bad. So it doesn't matter if you nag or not, you cannot change almost anything. So you might as well say things with fun. You are explaining yourself to others, but you are not uh, dumping their, your problem to them and make them uh, unhappy. Uh, when your father left, um, the lady in our household that used to wash their clothes came to my mother and said that your father left a pair of socks. And I had that, uh, and I don't know why I, I chose to have one uh, until uh, I came to Iran, I came to Tehran. And uh, at the time I was with a group of the Baha'i youth, uh, we were working in a television and radio production. So I had the privilege to be very close to your father and one of the very famous talk show hosts and everybody else. And then uh, I told him that uh, I have a memory from you. And he was very happy and he said, what is it? I said, your memory is your pair of socks. And your father was dying laughing. <laughs> and, you know, he was wondering that why did I keep that one for that many years? I want to tell you that anything that we say for the people that willingly they give the life for the path of Baha'u'llah, it does not says what it is. I invite all of your friends and everybody that is listening to me, try to find a tablet from Baha'u'llah that he explained word line by line. He says, you have been created to whatever. You have been created to do what forever. And I remember in uh, one of the meetings that this was used, one of the members of the House of Justice explained it in a 
sort of very um, ordinary way for majority of us because from different nation to understand it in, in English. I understand from him that when you accept Baha'u'llah in your heart, whether you are born in a family or you become a Baha'i, in both case, you accept at the age of 15. You got to understand at the time that you put your heart online with Baha'u'llah, your life literally is not yours. And I believe even if you are not Baha'i, your life is not yours. Okay? Remember the House of Justice, uh, they, they quote beloved guardian and said, in the world, there are two parallel motion that is working, destructive and constructive. So Baha'is are constructive and the destructive, it needs to happen. As a retired architect, I tell you something, this civilization need to be destroyed for us as a laborers of Baha'u'llah and as an architect of the future of mankind to be able to build this. He is laughing at us at the moment in the kingdom of Abha. And if you notice throughout the time that you were talking, I had a problem to keep my smile. It brings tears to my eye. And I can tell you something, if, if we say no, as Abdul Baha said, we are not saying the truth. He said, when I lost my father, it was difficult. It is difficult for us, but we got to know that the more happier we are, the more happier we make them there. God bless you and your lovely sister and your brother that I remember very small size of you. Thank you. The question about like, how were they raised? You know, you know the faith of Baha'u'llah is for every person on this planet. And if every single one of humanity, 100% of them did not have the capacity to rise to this occasion, to sacrifice, Baha'u'llah wouldn't have come, right? I mean, it's not only a few people. It's just that at that moment, maybe he chooses few people because there are so many few, I mean, we didn't have too many Baha'is in the world, right? But it's, it's a promise for everyone. As Dr. Banani in his translation of these letters said, what is martyrdom? And as General Jun so, so eloquently said, you know, it really uh, proves the sanity of that station and, and it's the hope of, for all of us. Uh, it's a promise that we have we can actually rise to such occasions. So yes, family is important, but listen, um, so many people, I mean, uh, everybody, everybody's in the same, humanity is in the same boat. And I really believe that. And you know, these are heroes that we know of, okay? There are millions of heroes nobody hears about. At the same time that these exit persecutions were happening in Iran, in Iraq, National Assembly of Iraq was in prison. A friend of mine whose father was in that National Assembly, they were in prison and he went blind. And I always felt really uncomfortable in front of her, I almost apologetic that look, they're talking about my parents, but no, not, they're not talking about your father. So, you know, the heroes are everywhere, okay? And so, but these people that we know, at least, you know, we just, we just happen to know them. And, uh, but it's a promise for, for the entire humanity, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, and mm -hmm. in fact, also we know that people who have suffered so much in their lives, uh, a lot of these heroes and heroines outside of the Baha'i faith, you know, people who have contributed so much to society are those sometimes they come from the, under the worst circumstances, you know. So um, I think we all need to be happy that, you know, we all have the uh, opportunity to grow. Spiritual growth is possible for everybody. That's reassuring to hear. Thank you very much, dear Mona. Thank you. We have a couple more questions. Next would be uh, dear Sheree from the United Kingdom. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mona John. It's a pleasure. Can I just say a um, couple of things? Um, in uh, 1982, that was the time that um, I'm proud to say that I was um, uh, investigating the faith. And um, one of the... Um, one of the questions uh, when I was a child in Iran, uh, always had, I brought up in a non-Muslim family, uh, you know, non-practicing Muslim family. You know, we're all, most of Iranians are Muslim. And one of the question I always remember asking my grandmother, who's the only person who uh, prayed was that, I used to ask my grandmother during the Ashura and during the Muharram that, if, them, if being martyrdom is such a great thing, uh, why is it that everybody's crying for them? Why is it that people are beating themselves up? 
and uh, amongst all the other questions I had as I grew up. And in um, 1982, when I was, uh, you know, encountered more Baha'is in Hormuz, um, I married in the house of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Azizi. And that year, Mr. Um, Aziz Pools were martyred, I think, in Iran. And I remember standing in the memorial meeting in Mrs. Aziz's house. And the speaker, uh, I wasn't a Baha'i, I was just you know, inquiring at the time. So it was a very much confusion for me. The way the children of Aziz Pools were talking about their parents, I was, I just wanted to know, wanted the Baha'is to know from the outside, from the outside, it is overwhelming the way the Baha'i attitude is towards martyrdom because even the Muslim people, uh, or I don't know about other religions, when you talk about the martyrdom, you still cry, you still kill yourself over the tomb of your parents or your talk. But the way they were presenting themselves for me was a phenomenal. It was a new phenomenon. It was a, a revolution to me. How could they talk about their parents and not be crying? And um, so the concept of martyrdom is a very new thing, uh, you know, for me. And the Baha'is demonstrated it in different way. And also earlier on, we talked about the attitude of the Baha'is. And I wanted to say, yes, these two have caused so many, so many uh, flowers to blossom in terms of new Baha'is to come. In that year, so many people, me amongst a lot of my friends became Baha'is. And it was, I, I knew uh, Dr. Mahmoudi as a, as a child, you know, listen to it. And, and the Baha'is, these, these were the, the meaning of martyrdom to me became clear. And after that, I remember for years after, people were telling me, why am I not going to Iran? And, um, and I would say, I would never go because if they ask me, I have to say I'm a Baha'i. And people would say, well, then lie. Just say I'm not, you know, just save yourself. And it was at that time that I thought, well, if I lie, what is the difference? Uh, me changing my religion, changing myself, because I always believed that to be a Baha'i, you have to be better than what you were before. I was, I was a good person. I wasn't a bad person. But to be a Baha'i, you have to excel yourself in whatever you have. And um, so I just wanted to thank you and all the Baha'is for showing the different attitude towards martyrdom and towards what it means to be a Baha'i. Thank you. Thank you very much for those thoughts, dear Shuri. And of course, Mr. Mahmoubi for your, for your wonderful comments as well. Uh, we have a few more comments still to come, also from Professor Khadadad in Chicago as well. This comment is for those who struggle to grasp this level of sacrifice for one's belief. This whole theme of sacrifice and martyrdom brings forth a central question. I have been asked this question by a dear friend who is not a Baha'i, but a good friend of Baha'is. An interesting question, perhaps what you may have faced also, many of you, which was asked a long, long, many centuries ago from the great Socrates, who was faced, who was condemned, who was faced to take the poison for his beliefs in one God and corruption of the youth. The question was, is it not better for you to deny, to recant, in order to survive? And would it not be better because then you can survive and continue to serve and promote your beliefs? Socrates provided the answer. In essence, what he said, if I were to recant, I would no longer be Socrates. I would no longer be me. I think the answer for those who don't recant, even as a matter of convenience, for me lies in the answer that Socrates provided. 
So he went on and took the poison and he died for his beliefs. And hence he has lived over the ages and his thoughts and teachings have been promoted. Thank you for your patience. Beautifully said, dear Professor Khalilad. Thank you so much. The next comment comes from Toronto. If I could ask Syed Yazdan Mer, please, to share, uh, share your thoughts. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very, very much. I actually grew up in the same community as Mona and her parents. I don't know if she remembers me and my brothers and my dad, Mr. Yazdan Mer, who had a little shop on the way to her, her parents' home. Um, what I can say is essentially, it's full of memories of her parents, how they conducted and grew the community in the Gohardash, which is just suburbs of Karaj. And a couple of things that I just wanted to mention was they were really illuminating deepening and summer schools that we had in the area. But one of the, one of the things that as a child, I really mesmerized with the attitude of her parents was whenever they, they visited our home, my, my father used to hold quite a bit of deepenings with non Baha'is and they always were invited to give speeches. And what I clearly rem remember was those dark nights when her father left and there was always at the door, there was always, we could always see a car across the street with few people in it. And this is a story before, even before the revolution. And it was obvious that people were, which were um, Islamic uh, extremists, they were always following her, uh, her parents. They were al always following her father. They knew him very, very well. But he just was in a different space on his own. And he was, when we were telling him, look, the car is, is um, chasing you and he was always laughing saying, oh, they're just always doing their own job. Don't worry about it. And it just tells me even as a child, how comfortable they were in their own space that nothing really could move them. And these are special souls. And I just wanna make another mention because I saw another friend who's on this um, meeting uh, and um, his father, Mr. Zabihian, was member of the assembly of Yazd. And the people, the, the, uh, the revolutionary guard knew him so well that he actually moved from Yazd during those hard uh, times to Shiraz. And they picked him up on the streets of Shiraz. They knew him so well, they picked him up on the streets of Shiraz and they murdered him. So it's just the status that they lived is beyond imagination and how comfortable they were in their status and where, where they were is beyond me. That, I just wanted to mention that point and my memory out of it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much again for that wonderful comment there. Next, we have a comment from Sweden. Please. Allah, my dear friends. Mona John, I wanted to show, share you something with you from uh, the memory of how I have from your father. He was uh, my headmaster at Maktab Nobacht from first to sixth grade. And I never forget where, whenever I went to him and asked him whether I can be, uh, if I can uh, be free from school because we had Baha'i holidays. He always, always said, Janam, Azizam, he always called us my dear, dearest. He was always so kind. And I also remember he uh, arranged a, th a theater and he himself uh, said all the, wrote all the uh, poems and the, po and the theater was about uh, temptation. And I had the first role I was in sixth grade and I remember that we had this theater with, uh, it was in uh, Anjumani Iran Amrika. It was an institution of Iranian American in Tehran. And uh, I still, it's unbelievable. I still remember the poem and it goes like this. It's in Persian. Manam vasvase dive penhani ruh. Bedar bordam az ra farzand nu. 
بپاشم به هر گوشه بذر فساد ز دستم روات دود من ها به باد these was the first two verses i uh, recited and it was your dear father i never never ever forget his beautiful face and i had several dreams about him and um, god bless you and um, uh, i don't know what else to say he was really dear a dear person uh, hello yeah. um, <laughs> Mikhail, could you or or mamad um, me and they were just discussing would you like to say maybe a few words about zarin either from her childhood or from um, when she was in prison? Oh, it would be very difficult. Uh, my dear husband is here. He is the brother of Zarin, and Zarin also was my cousin. Uh, she was among the 10 Baha'i women in Shiraz that was martyred in 1983, 18th of June. Um, uh, uh, excuse me, I have to say something about the Mr. Mahmoudi, uh, I didn't want to say, but because my wife came inside, I have to say that when I was finished my study in, in England, I went back to uh, Iran to work in 1977. I was the study field producing. And because I know Mr. Mahmoudi was in that branch, I went to visit him to maybe he helped me and find a job. I was talking to him. He wrote a letter, give it to me by his hand to Genus. No, so Shiva. Shiva, Shiva Sadullah Sadullah. Dear doctor, can you help the, this my friend to find it? I keep this letter. I never went to visit her, but I keep that letter. And still I have this letter yeah. by your father's hand. I never forget. I don't know where to begin because uh, I, we had a memorial for these 10 women uh, on 18th of June this year, but I can only tell you one thing maybe. Uh, uh, when Zarin went uh, to prison, they arrested her, the mother and the father together. And during two days, they arrested about 80 Baha'is in Shiraz. And uh, she was among those 10 women also. And uh, she's, the father said to us, because the father was in prison, to, she, he still was in prison after they, uh, uh, they executed Zarin. He was still in prison. And when he came out, they came and visited us in, uh, in Sweden. He told us that he had a chance to have a visit with Zarin because the women's uh, department uh, part was, there, was uh, different from the men's. And only once they had this chance to uh, meet each other in person because the interrogator gathered all the Baha'is in Shiraz in the prison and told them uh, in that gathering that you have to recount your faith. Otherwise we are going to execute all of you. And at the end, when he said, now I'm finished, and now you can go back to your cells, the father of Zarin asked whether we, have, we are allowed to uh, visit our uh, relatives because some of us have their daughters and their wives among the prisoners. Are we allowed to do that? And uh, the interrogator said, yes, yes, you are allowed to do that. And the father said, I turned my, my I turned, and I saw Zarin, and then Zarin came and she hold me like this. She hugged me and she put her hands on my shoulders and said, Father, please be strong. Make me proud, be strong. And the father said, it was so shocking to me. That was the only thing she said. And then she said, if they uh, decided if they decide to execute us, please don't ask for the last meeting because I don't want that. And the father said, don't worry, don't worry, I won't do that. And that was the only time they had this meeting. There are so many other things, so many stories I can tell you, but we don't have the time. So thank you for the time you gave me. Thank you.
the angels of Shiraz. Love you. Love you too. Love you too. Thank you so very much for sharing those thoughts. I understand how difficult that is. And like the stories we've heard today, absolutely touching and remarkable and very inspiring for us to realize what a great privilege, what a great gift we have in having our faith and being able to be living martyrs for the moment. Next uh, comment, um, and I'm slightly conscious of the time, so if we're able to um, try and make our points in a, a, a concise manner from now, that'd be wonderful, if possible. But um, uh, dear Alex from Norway uh, is waiting to, uh, to make a comment. Thank you very much. Dear Alex, please. What do you feel is your gift uh, to the world uh, through your experience, the special experience you have? We all have something to give to the world, clearly. Uh, and the Baha'is of Iran are especially privileged to have uh, suffered, uh, literally, and yes. Why is it your privilege to sort of be, in a way, right, to be related to those people and being able to sort of share these things, of course, not, not the sacrifice itself, but just be in a position to understand and just be near them. Um, boy, um, the, the, I mean, uh, given the constraints of time, I'll try to be brief. Uh, the, um, dear Alex, this is only our team's personal opinion. This is not, I'm just sharing with you my own opinion. So please just take it as that. Thank you. Um, the, the way that I feel, the way I understand it for me is, is the concept of martyrdom is a concept of a progressive level of service and sacrifice. That it isn't just that an individual goes and stands in front of a bullet or, um, or kisses the, the noose. Um, that it's a service and it's a sacrifice. And each one of these individuals, when you read their stories, they would given the opportunity, they would stay and serve. Given the opportunity, they would live. Given the opportunity, they would spend time with their family members that they deeply loved. Uh, I noticed some of somebody put a link on the letters that was translated for, by Dr. Banani um, and published in the, the World Order magazine. There is a letter in there from my from from my mother, and when you read it, you'll see that she has this intense love for her kids. So understanding that this is not something that they would choose to do unless this is what was the requirement. Um, the, the the requirement of martyrdom, I think, is quite mystical. This is uh, one of the things that I appreciate about the faith. Is, is it intense logic and the fact that it makes sense, but it also brings with it this deep mystical feelings. And this is that, um, why is it? Uh, and Baha'u'llah himself says that, that he, has, he, he has ordained or God has ordained that it is the blood of these individuals that makes the tree of the faith grow. But why that happens uh, to me after these many years is still a mystery. I, I have, when I think about them, I think of them at multiple levels. I think of them about as, as my parents. And so when I think about them as my parents, I get sad. Um, um, you know, there's a love for parents, right? I, you know, knowing that my kids didn't get a chance to spend time with them that my grandkids will not get to see them until they're in different worlds. So as, a, as an individual, it is incredibly painful, but I don't feel I own them. I don't feel that they are mine to keep or they are mine to hold on to. The sacrifices that these people made were made for the world. Um, what they gave, they gave this so that we would be in a better place, so that the world order of Baha'u'llah unfolds. So in, in that sense, you have a right to them as much as I do. Um, you own them as much as I do, because this is, this is an act of sacrifice. So it's, it's there are very, uh, as, a, as an individual, this is a very, very mixed and dynamic feelings. And I also feel sad. I, I, I feel sad for the country that lost these souls. 
I mean, these are these are people who would be celebrated in any country. These are individuals who would be cherished, who would be on newspapers, who would, you know, leaders of thought, and that the country chooses to take them to this pathway. So I feel sad for for the country. So I'm sorry, David. Thank you, thank you very much for for sharing those thoughts, as as difficult as they were, and of course we. Uh, yeah. We, we are nothing but grateful to hear from you, from each and every one of you. And as I say, for us, it's something we will never understand who haven't been on the receiving side of it or anything. So it's a, a very mysterious thing, as you quite rightly said. Thank you for sharing those thoughts. Next in line, we have dear Dr. Um, Dr. Danish uh, Tahereh, um, who's uh, been waiting for the hand up, please. And then we will go to Ariana and uh, Kehan Khadem as well. Sorry that I'm sobbing because... You know, when when the revolution happened, Nana and Mona and Artin weren't in Iran. And when Artin was talking about them as parents, you know, I was a child that was hanging around them. And I have had many experiences when the Mahmoudis missed their children so much that they used to have to resort to, you know, useless creatures like me to hold us. Mr. Mahmoud, you had an expression to describe his children. It was Aramidjan, the tranquility of my soul. And he would hold us, any kid, you know. We weren't anywhere near what our teen and Mona and Nana meant to them. But they would hold on to us. And I remember he would, you know, take a deep breath, smelling our hair, and would say, Aramajan, man, And I knew then, as I know now, he wasn't talking about anyone but his three people who are among us today. But the reason why I had my hand up earlier is that, again, I'm sorry, this is not the way I should be speaking, but it's an emotional night. Um, We've talked about Mr. and Mrs. Mahmoud in many different respects, but one respect that I think is incredibly important at this point as we, you know, we've just started 2021. This is officially now the 100th anniversary of um, the passing of the master. And again, I want to go back to the letter of the House of Justice and, and how they've described what we're going to experience over the coming decades. And I, I feel very strongly... To, to talk about Mr. Mahmoud a little bit as a husband. Because Mona Jun rightfully mentioned that, you know, Mrs. Mahmoud was a very young woman when she was martyred, and yet she's accomplished so much. And despite the fact that she was a wonderful woman and, and totally multi talented in many ways, I, I, again, this is my little two cents, you know, it could be completely wrong, but from what I saw as a child, the way Mr. Mahmoudi supported her, the way he loved her. You know, they were a couple, they had their challenges, but the way he loved and supported her was exemplary. And I think in the Baha'i community in particular, we really need men now. We need husbands, future mm -hmm. husbands, former husbands, to um, allow women to rise up to the level that the House of Justice is calling us to in order to fulfill the goals of the plan. So that was my personal two cents that I wanted to share, but I was so moved by seeing Artin John and what he said that I just wanted to share. Um, I'm so grateful to be in your company. Thank you. Thank you very much for those wonderful comments, um, Dita Thank you. Aloha for everyone. I just want to say that uh, you're talking about my parents and the Martyrs. It's only one thing comes to my mind is that we need to serve. We need to work hard. The whole thing my parents want us to do, Mona and our team that we serve the faith and help the board to change. So they martyred on one side. That's our parents, as our team said, there's a lot of love. Each time I talk about them, I cry, but they don't belong to us. The martyrs do not belong to any family. They belong to the world, family of the world. And we have one more year left from our plan, so we need to work harder and harder. I remember when I heard about the martyrdom, after two weeks, I was in Solomon Island. I went to the villages 
It's like my mom says to me, go, don't stay here. So I went, I carry my one year old, I carry my two, two, three years old and went with a big man to villages from one village to another to teach the faith. I think that's what they want. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very emotional, I understand. And I find it beautiful that they don't belong to any family. And really, it really is a case of, of course, the ultimate sacrifice and the ultimate blessing. I mean, it's, it's two sides of a coin, I guess, you know, but it's, it really is the example for us is to really do all we can and realize the, the priceless privilege that we have been gifted with the faith and um, to play our parts. Because if we don't play our parts, it will be lost forever. And who knows what exactly our part is. Ladies and gentlemen, the comments, questions have all been wonderful. And as the comment from New Zealand quite rightly says, this should inspire us to really, to take the faith, to live it, to breathe it, to really delve into those gems and grow ourselves and share this message of His Holiness Baha'u'llah with others. It's the one thing that can really change the fortunes of the world to this extent. Dear Mona or the siblings, are there any final comments you wish to make? Thank you very much. It was a true blessing. And... Um, um... That, that's all. It was just been an emotional morning. And, and I think I couldn't have said it better than uh, uh, Artina and Nana. Uh, they really do not belong to us. And I always feel a little bit shy about, you know, talking about my parents because they have been talked about a lot. And uh, I just, uh, again, one martyr is every martyr. They're, they're, they do belong to everyone. And we just had the privilege of, of knowing them a little bit more personally. But someone like Tahir Ejun basically had this, the same experience. She was their little, she was their fourth child, basically. Uh, my, my sister, Ariana, and I called Tahir Ejun uh, our little sister. Thank you very much for this uh, honor and privilege of, of being able to share these things. Um, and um, love you very much, all of you. Um, and as you could tell, my, my brother always gets emotional. I mean, it's, and somebody asked about it. Uh, it's, it's, it's as a parent, you know, as, as children, it's extremely painful. But then you sort of separate yourself from that and then you look at it from a different angle and it becomes a little bit different. You separate yourself, they don't belong to you, they belong to somebody else. And you just, uh, it is what it is and, and God chooses, nobody has the right to question as well. And it's, and I, I think everyone will testify to the fact that these people, it was by mere, everything was in his, uh, Baha'u'llah's hands. The timing, uh, if he wanted, he could, have, uh, he could have prevented all of this thing from happening. So in the end, he do it whatsoever he will it. And no one is given the right to question his will. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. As I say, this is a gift and it's both the story of your wonderful parents or Zarin Mahimi as well. And, and thank you very much from Sweden for sharing those dear comments. These are the things that will inspire us. And it's, it's the blood of the martyrs, obviously, that give life to the tree of faith. And it really is such a blessing for you to have graced our Zoom with this. So ladies and gentlemen, that being said, a reminder to everyone, these Zooms, again, we've been carrying on for nine months, um, was every day for a, for a good part. Now it's, it's, it's certainly Monday, every day of the week, bar Saturdays, Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, we're studying the revelation of Baha'u'llah. You are all warmly invited to join us. And on Wednesdays, we study the advent of divine justice. It's always at the same time with the same link. So we do hope many of you will join us. And of course, this will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube. As um, you can find many of these things, just search my name on YouTube. And whether it's the Dawnbreakers, What Passes By, The Promised Day Has Come, we have Priceless Pearl, we've been through a whole bunch of books and you can find them all there, of course. So we do hope you uh, do join us for some of them. And again, to the entire families of both the Zarian Mahami and of course your the Mahmoudi family, we are very, very grateful indeed. Please, if you would kick us off with the prayers and whoever so wishes to share some prayers um, afterwards, please just jump straight in. Thank you very much. در جستجوی او و 
ولی محروم و محجور از کوی او اما تو یافتی تو شناختی تو نرد خدمت باختی و کار خود ساختی و علم فوز و فلاح افراختی طرف کایتی و غریب بشارتی آنان که نشستن یافتن آنان که جستن نیافتن استغفر الله جستجوی شاد جستجوی سیرا بود نتش و طلب شان طلب آقلان بود ناشقان آقلان خوششین از سر لیلی قافلان که این کرامت نیست جوز مجنون خرمنسوز را عاشق نشسته به هنز آقل متحرک ولبه ها ای